Hello. So, um, in the previous two lectures, we've seen the concept of a vector space over a field. And we've also seen how we can use this concept to understand a field extension better. So uh, now let's go back to the concept of splitting fields and uh, see how we can use uh, how we can use these concepts about vector fields and so on to ask new questions about the splitting fields. Um, in today's lecture, we will focus on a splitting field of x to the n minus one over q. And this splitting field um, has a has a historical um, importance. Um, this was essentially uh, studied in order to understand Fermat's last conjecture better. This is among one of the uh, starting splitting fields that people uh, studied. Let me quickly recall that x to the n minus 1 can be decomposed as x minus 1 times x minus zeta sub n to the dot x minus zeta sub n to power n minus 1, where zeta sub n is e to power 2 pi i over n. So here we are taking this decomposition in a ring of polynomials uh, in, with coefficients in complex numbers. And this we essentially have um, from uh, complex analysis or complex numbers, basics of complex numbers. Um, we can understand the nth roots of unity um, by um, understanding the fact that when we multiply a complex unit by itself, we are just rotating on the unit circle. So therefore, the solutions of x to the n minus one equal to zero consists of uh, complex numbers and that have angle um, 2 pi i over n and integer multiple of 2 pi i over n. That's why we can come up with this kind of decomposition in C bracket x. And uh, by definition of a splitting field, you have to add all of these zeros to q in order to get the splitting field of x to the n minus 1, a splitting field of x to the n minus 1 over q and uh, we have observed that it's enough to add zeta sub n to q, and then automatically we get all the zeros. Therefore, q bracket zeta sub n is a splitting field of x to the n minus 1 over q. Now, the question is, what is the degree of this field extension? What can I say about, I mean, how many, what is the dimension of q uh, bracket zeta sub n uh, as a q vector space? We have already seen that if alpha is an algebraic number, if, an, an, if alpha is algebraic over a field f, then the degree of the field extension after joining alpha to f as an f vector space, so it's a degree, the degree of the field extension f bracket alpha um, as an extension of f, so the degree of this field extension is precisely the degree of the minimal polynomial of alpha over f. So this we've seen before. So this means when I want to answer this question, that what is the degree of the um, field extension q bracket zeta sub n over q, and this is equivalent to asking, what can we say about the degree of the minimal polynomial of zeta sub n over q? Can we find what is the minimal polynomial of zeta sub n over q? At least can we describe what kind of polynomial it is? Okay, let's start with uh, the fact that zeta sub n is a zero of x to the n minus one, and therefore the minimal polynomial of zeta sub n over q sh should divide x to the n minus one and it is irreducible, Therefore, it is an irreducible factor of x to the n minus 1 in q bracket x. So it, it is irreducible in, uh, in q bracket x. Now, by the fact that x to the n minus 1 can be decomposed completely um, uh, in linear factors in complex numbers and all the roots of powers of zeta sub n, we can deduce that all the zeros of the minimal polynomial of zeta sub n are also certain powers of zeta sub n. 
So what does that mean? This means we can find I1, I2, da da da, I M. We don't know what M is at, at this point, and we don't know what uh, I sub J's are. But what we do know is that we can definitely find uh, such uh, integers. We can definitely find such integers uh, I1, I2, da da da, I M in the range from 1 to n. And because we know zeta sub n is a zero of this minimal polynomial, we can assume without loss of generality that the first index, I mean, the first um, power is 1. So zeta sub n is a zero of this minimal polynomial. And we can decompose it into these linear, fact uh, linear factors in C bracket x. Now, what can we say about other zeros? So that's the kind of information we need in order to understand the minimal polynomial of zeta sub n over q. Uh, in order to understand this, we are going to recall a, a result that we've seen before. So remember, if alpha and alpha prime are zeros of an irreducible polynomial, then we can definitely find an f isomorphism, that means an f linear map that sends alpha to alpha prime. So this is this we did in a kind of two steps. First, using evaluation map, identifying f bracket alpha as a quotient of f bracket x by its minimal polynomial, and then um, doing the same for alpha prime. So that way we get an isomorphism between f bracket alpha and f bracket alpha prime and send alpha to alpha prime. And these maps um, send f to f like identity, and therefore it's an f isomorphism. So having this in mind, we are going to apply this to, uh, to the minimal polynomial of zeta sub n. That means I can definitely send zeta sub n to zeta sub n to power i sub j. And in fact, there exists an q isomorphism from q bracket zeta sub n to q bracket this other root of the minimal polynomial that sends zeta sub n to this other root. So that we immediately get out of this result that we do have an f isomorphism that sends one zero to the other one. Okay, so now knowing this, we deduce that because I mean, remember theta sub j is an isomorphism. So it preserves multiplicative structure of this ring. In particular, the order of zeta sub n and the order of theta sub j of zeta sub n should be the same. So again, let me repeat. So because a theta sub j is, an, is a ring isomorphism, we can get that order, the multiplicative order of zeta sub n and the multiplicative order of the image of zeta sub n under this ring isomorphism should be the same. But theta sub j sends zeta sub n to this power of zeta sub n, zeta sub n to raise to power i sub j. And order of an element raised to power m is the same as the order of the element divided by the GCD of the order and this power. So this we have from group theory. Again, let me recall this statement that order of an element raised to power m is order of g divided by GCD of order of G and M. So using this result here, we get uh, the above equality. But notice that order of zeta sub n as a multiplicative, uh, a, the multiplicative order of zeta sub n is nothing but n. So the n, when I raise zeta sub n to power n, I do get one. And that's the smallest number that I can reach to one. So that means order of zeta sub n, the multiplicative order of zeta sub n is n. Therefore, uh, we get this necessary condition for uh, the powers that appear over here. So these powers. So the necessary condition for these powers is that all of them should be co-prime with n. So the GCD of n and i sub j's, no matter what j I pick, should be 1. So this is a necessity. It doesn't mean that uh, we are proving that this is the case always. So meaning 
that if I tell you that to if if I tell you I and uh, I and N are co-prime, then I should appear in the power. We are not proving that yet. What we are showing is that all these powers should be definitely co-prime with N. Now, next, what we want to do is actually show the other way around. But we take this as a motivation to define the cyclotomic, the nth cyclotomic binomial. So what is the nth cyclotomic binomial? So the nth cyclotomic binomial we denote it by capital V sub n, bracket, I mean, capital V sub n of x, is x minus all those powers of zeta sub n where i is indeed co-prime with n. So exactly the our candidate zeros for the minimal binomial of zeta sub n, we take them, we put them as linear factors uh, and define phi sub n. Okay, that's the definition of the nth cyclotomic binomial. And we are going to investigate this binomial further now. But let's summarize what we have already proved. We have proved that every linear factor of the minimal binomial of zeta sub n should appear in this product. And therefore, what we have proved is that if I look at the minimal binomial of zeta sub n over q, then it should divide phi sub n of x in, okay, so all the coefficients belong to this ring. So I can say that it divides this in a ring of binomials with coefficients inside this uh, splitting. Okay, so again, the minimal binomial of zeta sub n divides this nth cyclotomic binomial. What we want to show is equality. We want to prove that these two binomials are indeed equal. But how can we do it? The key result that's going to help us to show uh, to show that the minimal binomial of zeta sub n is precisely the nth cyclotomic binomial is the following proposition. We show that x to the n minus 1 is equal to product of d cyclotomic binomials as d ranges over positive divisors of n. So that's one of the key properties of uh, n cyclotomic binomials in general, and uh, we want to prove this state. Okay, let's start with the decomposition uh, of x to the n minus one, or maybe it's better to start uh, by comparing the degrees of both sides. So when I compare the degrees of both sides, what do we get? In order to do that, I need to understand what is the degree of the uh, the teeth cyclotomic binomial. So let's go back to the definition. So as you can see over here, the degree of the nth cyclotomic binomial is the same as the number of integers in the range 1 to n that are co-prime with n. So what does that mean? That's exactly the definition of the Euler phi function at n. So the degree of the nth cyclotomic binomial is precisely the Euler phi function uh, of n. That's another reason that we denote the cyclotomic binomial with capital V. So if I come back to this proposition and, and compare the degree of both sides in this equation, on the left-hand side, I get n. On the right-hand side, I have to add the degree of the dth, uh, the dth uh, cyclotomic binomial as d runs through the divisors, positive divisors of n. As we discussed, the degree of capital phi sub d is phi of d, the Euler phi function. Now, this equality itself we have proved earlier. In fact, you've seen it in your homework assignment. And the way that you, I mean, the way that I presented the hints and the steps in the homework assignment and you went through it and you proved it was by considering uh, the uh, elements of order D in a cyclic group of order N. 
So at the end of the day, it will it boil down by splitting the numbers from, from one to n or zero to n minus one according to their GCD with n. Okay, so we are going to use the same idea in order to address this equality. So what do I mean by that? Um, you start with splitting x to the n minus one, decomposing it into irreducible factors in C bracket x. And we have already done this and we've said that uh, the linear factors are x minus zeta sub n to power i. So if you think about it, the zeros of this equality I and mean, the zeros of this polynomial, they form uh, a cyclic group of order n. These are zeta sub n to power i's. So what we will do, we are going to do the partitioning as before as we did when you wanted to prove this statement. Uh, and we are going to consider uh, elements of uh, various order in this cyclic group of order n. Or more concretely, we are going to consider the set of indices, the set of powers i's where um, i is changing from zero to n, strictly less than n, and i and n, the GCD of i and n is d. And notice that because d is supposed to be a divisor of n, this set is non-empty unless, uh, this set is empty unless d uh, divides n. So that means I focus, I pick a divisor of n, and then I ask myself, what are the integers in this range that have uh, precisely d as their greatest common divisor with n. So remember that when GCD of, uh, GCD of i and n is d, if and only if GCD of i over d and n over d is one. Now, if I call i over d j, then j is an integer in this range and the GCD of j and n over d is one. So I can reparameterize this set, set O sub d as multiples of d where j, this d times j, where j, this parameter j is ranging from zero to n over d, strictly less than n over d, and j and n over d are copra. Now, this is a partitioning of the integers from zero to n. I can use this partitioning and partition the terms of this multiplication. And therefore, x to the n minus one can be written. So I first pick a positive divisor of n, then I consider all the integers i that are coming from O sub d and the linear factor corresponding to this i. I'm going to multiply them first and then let d vary. So essentially I'm looking at these factors, I'm reordering, regrouping my multiplication. First pick d, a positive divisor of m, and then consider all the integers in this range that have GCD with n equals to d. That's a partitioning of this interval and therefore we get this equality. So now let's focus on this uh, inner product, the product inside in this parentheses. So when I focus on that, by this discussion that we have over here, with this discussion, I can reparameterize the elements of O sub d and consider them as multiples of d, d times j, where j is in this range and j is co-prime with n over d. Okay, so now what is zeta sub n to power dj? Zeta sub n, what was it, zeta sub n? Zeta sub n itself is e to power 2 pi over n. This guy raised to power d is, you see, d goes in the numerator, I can put it in the denominator and remember that n is a multiple of d. So n over d is an integer. 
So I'm getting e to power two pi i divided by this integer n over d. This is what we denoted by zeta of n over d. So going back to this uh, multiplication that we had over here, this inner multiplication. So going back to this uh, inner multiplication, we get that I can replace this guy with zeta of n over d to power j. Okay, so let's see what we get. So I'm going to replace um, zeta sub n to power dj by zeta of n over d to power j. Now, j is running, ranging from non-negative integers that are strictly less than over d, and they are co-prime with n over d. That's exactly the definition of the cyclotomic, the n over d cyclotomic binomial. So I'm looking at the n over d roots of unity that have order precisely equal to n over d. That's a definition of this guy again. Let's let's recall that c uh, phi sub m of x is the product of z this, uh, of x minus z sub m to power i as i ranges from zero to strictly less than m, and GCD of i and m is supposed to be one. So by this definition, I mean, that's the definition of the mth cyclotomic binomial. When we plug in n over d, we get exactly this. And that means that we have this equality. OK. Now, now that we have this, we put it back in this inner product that we have over here, this guy. And what do we get? We end up getting that x to the n minus 1 is product of n over d cyclotomic binomial as d ranges over all the positive integer positive divisors of n. But notice, as d ranges over the positive divisors of n, n over d also ranges over the same set. So after all, what we are doing, we are writing d, I mean, we can kind of pair divisors, positive divisors of n by n times n over d. So we are pairing the divisors of n by looking at this. Now, as this guy ranges over all the positive, okay, as, as d ranges over all the positive divisors uh, of n, then automatically this also ranges over all the positive divisors of n. What I'm saying is that by changing the name of the variable, for instance, I can call n over d to be my uh, dummy variable d prime, then d prime is running through all the positive divisors of n, and this n over d, we can change it to this dummy variable d prime. Maybe it might be a bit more uh, clear if I write d prime instead of d over here. So this d prime uh, is like n over d in our previous uh, formula over here. So altogether, we get a claim that x to the n minus 1 is the product of the d and cyclotomic polynomials as d ranges over the positive divisors of n. Okay, so let's see how this can help us to um, to show irreducibility of uh, cyclotomic polynomials. But before showing that uh, these guys are in fact irreducible um, in Q bracket x, we have to show that they are indeed in Q bracket x. Uh, so the next lemma helps us to show that uh, cyclotomic polynomials are indeed integer polynomials. Okay, so that's our next goal. And we are going to prove this by induction on n. 
So the base case where n equals to one is clear because the first, con the first cyclotomic polynomial is nothing but x minus one. Therefore, it's an integer polynomial. So now we are going to proceed by a strong induction. Um, we assume that uh, for all the integers n that are strictly less than n and the nth cyclotomic polynomial is an integer polynomial. Now I want to argue why the nth cyclotomic polynomial is also an integer polynomial. But first thing first, we notice by the previous proposition that the nth cyclotomic polynomial is x to the n minus one divided by the product of phi sub d, the d of cyclotomic polynomials as d ranges over proper divisors, proper positive divisors of n. So we take a positive proper divisor, proper means d is not, the entire, is not n, we take uh, and we let d ranges over proper positive divisors of n, and then we multiply all the cyclotomic polynomials of uh, in the d cyclotomic polynomial, and by the previous proposition, we get this equality. So this means if I call the denominator to be uh, polynomial g, so if I call this guy to be g, then x to the n minus one div divided by g is a polynomial. So this means x to the n minus one is divisible by g in complex complex polynomials. Okay, let's have this in mind. Let's continue. What else do we know about g? By the induction hypothesis, we know that all phi sub d x's are integer polynomials. Therefore, g is also an integer polynomial. So by the induction hypothesis, this guy is an integer polynomial. And notice that cyclotomic polynomials, which are defined over here, these are also monic polynomials. So they are monic polynomials, their degree is the Euler phi function. And um, so, and by the induction hypothesis, the product of these guys are, uh, the product of these polynomials is an integer polynomial. So GX is an integer polynomial and it is monic. Therefore, actually I can define X to the N minus one by G in Z bracket X. I can divide and then I get a quotient and a remainder. So I get a quotient Q by the long division. There are unique Q and R in Z bracket X, such that X to the N minus one is G of X times this quotient plus the remainder R. And R being a remainder means the degree of R is strictly less than a degree of not n, yeah, degree of uh, g I meant to write, degree of g. So that's, and this pair q and r you unique. That's that's part of long division uh, theorem. But notice that in complex numbers. With, in polynomials with coefficients in sense like complex numbers, the same quotient and remainder work. You see, I can use long division in C bracket X, and then by the uniqueness of quotient and remainder, I say that because these properties one and two hold, and Q and R, both of them are also uh, polynomials with complex coefficients, that means that these are the same quotients and remainder if I consider x to the n minus one and g as polynomials inside C bracket x. But on the other hand, in C bracket x, we know that uh, g times the Euler, uh, g times the nth cyclotomic polynomial is x to the n minus one. That means what? That means that in complex numbers, we actually know what the remainder and what the quotient, what the quotient and remainder are. The quotient is the nth cyclotomic polynomial. 
and the remainder is just zero. But as we just pointed out, this should be the same Q and R as we divide them in Z bracket X, which means Q is the nth cyclotomic binomial and R is just zero. In particular, we deduce that the nth cyclotomic polynomial, which is Q, is an integer polynomial. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, so starting with these uh, uh, elements of order D, we deduce that um, when we multiply X minus uh, elements of order D, we end up getting a polynomial that has integer coefficients. Now, next, we get to the main theorem of today's lecture the nth cyclotomic binomial, or in general cyclotomic binomials, are irreducible in Q bracket X. So that's the main theorem that we wanted to prove, that we want to prove in today's lecture. So the nth cyclotomic binomial is irreducible in Q bracket X. The underlying idea in the proof is the same as before. We go from Q to Z and we kind of go from Z to Z sub P, uh, but this passage from Z to Z sub P is a bit more subtle here. Um, after you gain more uh, understanding of uh, finite fields, uh, the magic of the proof, in the presented proof, uh, will be a bit less. You, you understand why we should do what we are doing. Uh, but admittedly, as I present in today's lecture, some parts of the proof um, might seem a bit magical in the sense that uh, I will not explain completely why we are thinking about uh, certain ideas in the proof uh, and I just present the, the proof to you. Okay, so I, I explain a bit more when I get to that point. But let's start with uh, the more conceptual part of it. So, so we assume to the contrary that it is reducible. This part is quite similar to what, uh, what other, I mean, the other kind of proofs that we had for irreducibility. So we often assume that something is not irreducible and then we decompose it as a product of two polynomials with, with rational coefficients. We use Gauss's lemma and take the primitive forms of a G and H and we notice that phi sub n itself is an integer polynomial and it is monic, therefore it is primitive. Therefore, when I apply, when I consider uh, primitive forms of both sides and use the fact that uh, prim is a multiplicative function, the primitive form of the left-hand side is still phi sub n, but the primitive form of the right-hand side, we just said that it's, it's going to be G bar times H bar. So that means uh, we can in fact decompose a V sub N uh, into product of non-constant polynomials uh, in Z bracket. So that can help us to go from Q to Z. This part was almost identical to other uh, results that we proved about uh, irreducibility of polynomials. Now, now here is the, where the more magical part of the argument uh, appear. So I will present the idea first. Uh, I mean, the, the, the exact proof first, not the idea. I, I will present the exact proof first. And then at the end, uh, I will explain a bit more of why, um, why we are doing this, um, why we are approaching it like this. Okay, so suppose uh, zeta is a zero of uh, G bar. Okay, so we know that every zero of uh, the nth cyclotomic binomial uh, has multiplicative order n. So in particular, the zeta, that's, that's a zero of G bar, has multiplicative order Okay, that's, that's uh, an observation. Now, if I give you a prime number P, no matter what it is, when I give you a prime number P, if this P doesn't divide N, then when I raise zeta to power, raise it to power P, the multiplicative order doesn't change because P and N are co-prime 
the multiplicative order of zeta to power p is the same as the multiplicative order of zeta. So that means it is zeta to power p is also a zero of the nth cyclotomic polynomial. Remember, the nth cyclotomic polynomial uh, is the product of x minus all the uh, all the nth roots of unity that have that have order multiplicative order equal to n. So, because the nth cyclotomic polynomial is the product of g bar and h bar and zeta to power p is a zero of phi sub n, either zeta to power p is a zero of g bar or it's a zero of h bar. Now, our claim is that it's definitely still a zero of g bar. So this means when I start with a zero of g bar, when I raise it to some power p, where p is a prime number that doesn't depend, and that doesn't divide n, so still I will be in among the zeros of g bar. So then I'm going to raise it again and again over different primes, and then we should get to all the zeros of p sub n, and then we get a contradiction. That's the outline of the proof. Okay, let's see how the proof, uh, the, how we can prove the claim. So again, what is the claim? If zeta is a zero of g bar, p is a prime number that doesn't divide n, then zeta to power p is also a zero of g bar. Suppose to the contrary that this is not the case. So we are assuming that uh, zeta to power p is not a zero of g bar. With this argument that we had over here, and noticing that zeta to power p is definitely either a zero of g bar or h bar, we deduce that it should be a zero of h bar, which means zeta itself is a zero of h bar of x to the p. Therefore, the minimal polynomial of zeta over q should divide both g bar and h bar of x to the p. You see, when I plug in zeta to both of these polynomials, g bar and h bar of x to the p, I'm getting zero. Therefore, the minimal polynomial of zeta should divide both of these polynomials in q bracket x. So, by taking the, by looking at the primitive form of this polynomial and called, calling that primitive form Q, I get a non-constant common divisor for the polynomials G bar and, and H bar of X to the P. So now, so far, we found a common uh, divisor for G bar and H bar of X to power P. Now, here it comes um, the mod p uh, usage. So we are going now from z to z mod p. Because q is a common divisor of these two polynomials in z bracket x, when I look at it mod p, I get a common divisor of g bar mod p and h bar of x to the p, again mod p. Okay, so. Cp of uh, q is a common divisor of C Cp of uh, g bar x and C uh, and h bar of x to the p um, mod p. Okay. And now um, this means what? Now here is I mean here is the main reason the this should be the clarifying point that why, why did we consider uh, raising to power p at, at the beginning uh, at, from at this at the first place the key point is the following that when i look at things mod p because the characteristic is p then when i look at h bar and raise it to power p it's the same as looking at h bar of x to the p Remember, because of the Fermat's little theorem, uh, an integer raised to power p mod p doesn't change. And in characteristic p, 
uh, raising to power p is a ring homomorphism. So again, uh, let's uh, let me emphasize this. This is kind of crucial that when I look at the equation sigma a sub i x to x to power i, if I raise the entire thing to power p in z p bracket x, this is equal to a sub i raised to power p x to power p to power i because characteristic is p and because of the Fermat's little theorem this is the same as a sub i x to power p to power i so you see instead of x now i have x to power p so that's exactly this equality that we have over here and of the, the whole thing is in uh, zp bracket x so in zp bracket x i have this kind of equality i can raise to power p and that means i can put uh, i can take the same polynomial and um, instead of x write down x to power p this is the key uh, equality that helped us and, and this is more or less why we consider zeta to power p uh, at the first place so what we discussed over sh here shows that that we have a common divisor for these two polynomials so we have a common divisors for these two polynomials and therefore um, we have this uh, therefore these two polynomials g bar and h bar mod p raised to power p now they have a common divisor and because i mean we have we are working in a ufd every non-constant polynomial has an irreducible factor so it has an uh, they have a common irreducible factor in zp bracket x okay so um, again, uh, we are using the fact that ZP bracket X is a U of T, and therefore, um, the fact that a power of a polynomial and another polynomial have a common divisor is equivalent to saying that uh, H bar itself mod P and G bar mod P have a common divisor. So essentially, divisors of this guy irreducible divisors of this guy and irreducible divisors of h bar mod p are the same so this means we, are, we get a common divisor a common irreducible divisor for g bar mod p and h bar mod p so if i call this common irreducible divisor if i call it l then what we are getting is that so we have uh, then L squared. So if I call this common divisor L, then L squared divides G bar mod P times H bar mod P, but that is nothing but the nth cyclotomic polynomial mod P. This means the nth cyclotomic polynomial has an irreducible factor squared as a divisor but the nth cyclotomic polynomial itself is a divisor of x to the n minus one, which means x to the n minus one has square of some irreducible polynomial as a divisor. So again, that means that x to the n minus one has multiple zeros in its splitting field over z sub p, over this, uh, over z sub p because it has multiple it has a common divisor that it has an irreducible factor squared as a divisor if i take a zero of this uh, irreducible factor in its splitting wheel that would be a multiple zero of x to the n minus one but we've seen a very uh, concrete criterion for a polynomial to have a multiple zero in its splitting field the criterion is the following that f has multiple zeros in its splitting field precisely when 
its GCD with its derivative is not one. So I look at x to the n minus one, and, and then I have to compute its derivative. And because of the contrary assumption that we started with, we deduced that the GCD of these two polynomials is not one in ZP bracket x. But what is the, the derivative of x to the n minus one? It's n times x to power n minus one. Remember, p does not divide n. That means this number over here is just a unit. This is a unit in a zp bracket x. So from the GCD point of view, we don't care about the units. The whole question is, what is the GCD of x to the n minus one and x to power n minus one? And x to power n minus one has only one irreducible factor and the only irreducible factor of x to the n minus one is nothing but x. And remember, I mean, x has only one zero, that's zero. If x divides x to the n minus one, then zero should be a zero. That's one way of arguing. But other, other way, you can also see that when I divide this guy by x, it has a remainder that is negative one. It is not divisible by x. And that gives me a contradiction because that shows that the GCD of these two polynomials is one indeed. So that they don't have any irreducible factor in common. So the GCD is one. That gives me a contradiction. Why do we have the contradiction? What does it, what does it imply? We, we, this just shows the claim. This shows that if I tell you that zeta is a zero of G bar, and I give you a prime number that doesn't divide N, then zeta to power p is also a zero of g bar. That is what we showed so far. So how can we finish the proof? We notice that zeta sub n is a zero of the nth cyclotomic polynomial. So it's either zero of g bar or zero of h bar. Without loss of generality, we can assume that it's zero of g bar. There is no difference between g bar and h bar. So let's say zeta sub n is a zero of g bar. We just showed that if I give you a zero of g bar, then I can, I'm allowed to raise it to the power of different primes as long as the prime doesn't divide n. In particular, if I give you an integer i, I tell you this i is co-prime to n, I want to argue that we can raise zeta sub n to power i and still deduce that that's going to be a zero of g bar. How can I do that? Because i and n are co-prime, as I decompose i as product of primes, so I might have no prime, in that case, i is just one, but if as I decompose it into product of primes, all of these primes cannot divide n because by assumption, i and n are co-prime, so they have no prime factors in common. So we get these prime factors that do not divide n. So I can use this star, this claim that we have over here and raise zeta sub n to power p sub i is one after another. Because zeta sub n is a zero of g bar, so is zeta sub n to power p one. Because this is a zero of g bar, I can raise it to power p2, and I get that this one is also a zero of g bar. Then I raise it to power p3, then I raise it to power p4, and so on. And then by induction, we deduce that zeta sub n raised to power product of different primes, or not necessarily distinct, primes that are not divisors of n, we will be still, we still get zeros of g bar. But that means what? That means zeta sub n raised to power i, as long as i and n are co-prime, is still a zero of g bar. But every single zero of phi n is of this form. That means phi sub n, the nth cyclotomic polynomial, should be a divisor of g bar. Now, that implies the degree of phi sub n is less than or equal to degree of g. And that's a contradiction because g bar times uh, g bar times 
uh, h bar was supposed to be the phi sub n, and these were supposed to be non constant polynomials, so their degrees, both of them, were uh, strictly less than the degree of phi sub n, and therefore we get the contradiction. Okay, so um, this shows our claim that uh, phi sub n is uh, irreducible, and knowing that phi sub n is irreducible, we immediately deduce that um, the minimal polynomial of zeta sub n over q is precisely the nth cyclotomic binomial. And this implies that the degree of this field extension is the Euler phi function. We'll continue in the next lecture.